Welcome to the Woman Warriors Podcast, where we're working to help you call a truce with your anxiety. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here's your host, Elizabeth Cush, LCPC. Hi, and welcome back to the Woman Warriors podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Cush, and today my guest is Lourdes Viado. She is a depth psychologist providing psychotherapy for adults in her private practice in Las Vegas, Nevada, as well as mentorship and consulting services to clients worldwide. She is a Myers-Briggs Typology Indicator Certified Practitioner and uses a Jungian approach in her work with clients, integrating mindfulness, dream work, shadow work, metaphor, literature, poetry, and astrology in her work with clients. She is also the host of the top-rated Women in Depth podcast, Conversations About the Inner Lives of Women, which has been downloaded over 225,000 times in 96 countries and six continents. Lourdes is a colleague and friend, and I really appreciated her being on the podcast today. We're going to talk about dreams and depth psychology and how working with your unconscious can really help you create a different relationship with your anxiety. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Lourdes. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Woman Warriors podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Biz. It's an honor to be here, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Me too. Me too. So before we jump in, I just would love for you to tell us a little bit about yourself and what inspired you to do the depth work that you do. So I am, um, I guess my my title um, as far as work in the world <laughs> is a <laughs> marriage and family therapist, and um, I'm a psychologist also, um, and I work from a Jungian or depth psychology perspective. I work with adults in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, in terms of like counseling and therapy, but I also work with um, individuals worldwide providing mentorship, consulting, and, and I bring in astrology, also the Myers-Briggs Brig, typology um, indicator. I love using dreams and um, poetry and metaphor in, in my work with clients. Um, and I've been doing this, I think, when, I want to say this is my, my 16th year. Wow. Um, and I, I, I wasn't always, you know, working from a depth perspective. I started out like most of us do with, you know, our our graduate degree and you know, <laughs> our, the hours that we've done and we're kind of thrown out there in, you know, for me, I started out in an agency. Yeah. And I just realized pretty quickly that, I don't know, the, the manuals that, you know, I was trying to follow, uh, you know, the, the directions of this is what you do with this type of client. Right. It, it just... It was very cookbooky, I guess. It was like, you know, look yeah, this very, up and then this is what you do. <laughs> right. Very formulaic. Uh, very yeah. formulaic. Yeah. And I, at first I felt like, well, this is how it is because I'm new. You know, this is why you have to do this because you don't know yet. Right. And then um, I just I just started feeling like it, I would have to kind of look everything up before a session and then the, the treatment planning. And so I just knew that this type of supporting clients um, who were, you know, in some kind of emotional pain, it just didn't feel right to me. And um, I ended up having some personal, uh, personal stuff that I had to deal with that was very overwhelming um, Mm -hmm. in the realm of family and relationships. And this was probably five or six years after um, I was licensed. Mm -hmm. And um, I found myself in a bookstore Mm. and I stumbled across... um, some books on Jungian psychology and they were by Robert Bly on the shadow and the soul and the meaning of symptoms. 
and what uh, symptoms like anxiety and depression are are representing that mm. these are actually welcome visitors from your psyche with mm. messages and I was just really you know intrigued by the idea that the things that we struggle with um, it's not pathology you right. know and this just really I mean it just felt right and it just I wanted to know more and mm. you know um, in my classic style my husband teases me about this um, I decided but you know what? I think I'm going to enroll in a doctoral program. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know a lot more. <laughs> yeah. And I want to know more about this depth psychology thing. Uh. And so I did it like just I really didn't think it through. And, mm. you know, three months later, I'm sitting in a classroom um, at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara Wow. Um, in their depth psychology program talking about dreams. And that was the beginning of the process, and uh, I, I had a wonderful first year, but I, I have to say that it was um, incredibly intense. Uh, one thing with doing this type of study is you really have to look at yourself. Right. And the doctoral program actually became a very intense process of um, looking at myself in a mirror, not really being happy with what I was seeing, mm. um, being in a lot of painful emotions. And, um, you know, that was really this process. I eventually decided to go to um, transfer to Saybrook University in San Francisco because they offered a union study certificate mm -hmm. by way of the Jung Center in Houston, Texas. So I wow. actually went there every month for two wow. or three months. I'm sorry, for two years. And that was actually the, you know, kind of the beginning of the transformation of my practice, my relationships um, with others, my relationship with myself, my relationship to my wounds. And um, this is just, you know, I, I feel so blessed to have this experience and to be able to share it with, you know, with others in the world. Yeah. My experience with talking with other therapists, but also therapist friends that I feel like the people who know how the therapy works for themselves, you know, whatever particular mode of therapy they use or whatever clientele they decide to work with, if you have personal experience in it, it can be you make the best therapist <laughs> in that area. <laughs> yeah. You know, yes, I can see that. Uh -huh. And you know, it's interesting, because Carl Jung once said that um, every person's uh, psychology and he was speaking about, you know, therapists and, mm -hmm. and counselors is actually a psychology of the self, mm. you know, so, so it really is about the way that you view the world, the way you approach challenges, the way you support yourself and support others. And so, yes, you know, if you have um, found something that really has helped you, you're able to, um, in turn, you know, give that to others, which, you know, one of the aspects of Jungian psychology is the concept of archetypes. And, mm -hmm. One of the archetypes I've always resonated with is the archetype of the wounded healer. And um, in Jungian psychology, this is about the parts of ourselves that when we, when we go through some kind of wounding, the way that we heal is actually also with how we share our experiences with others. So as we continue to heal ourselves, we're able to help others and our interactions with others help us to heal also. It's this uh, yeah. synergistic effect. Yeah, yeah. I thoroughly agree with that. And it's interesting, or, you know, I can identify with that. Because I do find in my own practice that there are times when I'm struggling with a particular thing, and I am in therapy myself, too, as I do therapy, but that the people who enter my space may have similar stuff they're struggling with. And, yeah. you know, I'm in a place where I can recognize that, you know, if I need extra work on that, I can step away from this therapy room and do that. But I feel very privileged and able to help them with whatever that issue might be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always um, never cease to be inspired and amazed by, you know, the people who show up in this consulting room. I, I, I've i always mm. said that I feel like the people who come to therapy are some of the bravest, strongest souls. Mm. Because you come into this space and it's not a space where, it's, you know, you, you generally are going to feel good or you're going to be, you know, I mean, it's not that, <laughs> you know, a lot of time, 
many times it, it's it's difficult. Yeah, you know, it's, it can it, be very painful it can, work. It can be painful, and yeah. you know, I I think of others who perhaps you know choose to maybe you know deal with this in other ways or put it you know avoid it or distract themselves. And so I feel like you know those who ch- make that choice to to seek healing, seek support you know, just very courageous. And, you know, they have a lot of um, ability to tolerate and to get through these situations that are, um, that are just, you know, so, so much for a person to deal with. I have a lot of, um, Mm. again, admiration for, for anyone who is doing this kind of work in therapy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So on your website, you talk about working with you know, so depth psychology is really working with the unconscious, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so tell us about that and how that works. So if you're not conscious of something, how how do you work with it? Okay, so this is like a big question. Okay. <laughs> it's a couple part question, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so, so take so it apart of, as you need to. <laughs> one of the first one of the things I wanted to say about Jungian um psychology is, you know, it it is a branch of depth psychology. Mm -hmm. There can be psychodynamic therapy and other ways of approaching um, depth psychology. But one of the, um, I guess, the the themes of depth Mm -hmm. psychology is the acknowledgement that the unconscious is real. Mm -hmm. And the unconscious is the part of our psyche, which, you know, some people refer to as their mind, their soul, their psychological body. It's, it, you know, it's not something you can point to in a brain scan or a body scan and say, there it is. Right. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So it's very abstract, but um, it's the part of ourselves that is um, out of our conscious awareness. And we're not aware of it. You know, like right now, you and I are talking, we're, we're doing this interview. We're conscious of that. Mm-hmm. You know, but there are parts of our um, existence that are out of our immediate awareness. And um, this could be maybe, um, for example, feelings and uh, unmet needs or past wounding and your feelings about that. And the unconscious is large. If you think of um, like a boat, a rowboat mm-hmm. on the ocean, our consciousness is like that rowboat what we're aware of and the unconscious is the ocean Mm. so there's so much more that's out of our awareness and the i guess the goal or the work that happens in union therapy is helping the individual to become more aware of what is happening in their unconscious in order to address what's happening in conscious life so Mm -hmm. You know, there's a quote by um, Carl Jung, and basically it goes uh, something like this, that, you know, whatever we are unaware of, whatever we are unconscious of, um, the more we're un- the more unconscious we are, the more the more that will come to- that will happen to us as fate. Hmm. So, for example, if you're not aware of or have not acknowledged or haven't really <sighs> considered perhaps past trauma in, you know, in your childhood Mm -hmm. and you just kind of put it aside and you're going through life. I'm fine. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm I'm over that. Right. Right. The more likely that that's actually going to be affecting you. Mm. So maybe it shows up in you being, um, you know, just very successful. You just climb the ladder achievement after achievement. You know, you're, you're, you've always been able to get to whatever milestones you set for yourself and the, but the, but at the same time, there's this sense of never being satisfied with that. Just what's the next thing, and what's the next thing, and what's the next thing? Right. And that's one of the ways that we avoid or distract ourselves from from parts of ourselves that need um, our attention. And one of the things that I love with uh, union psychology or psychotherapy is that you know paying real paying close attention to the words that people use. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the images that they they bring up in their language, because those are ways, along with things like dreams, mm-hmm. that the unconscious kind of lets you know that it's present. It's trying to get your attention. And, you know, again, in depth psychology, symptoms are not looked at negatively. In fact, they're they're in, they're welcomed. That it, it's important for us to have these symptoms because without the symptoms, we wouldn't be uncomfortable enough to 
to make any changes. Yeah. Or even be aware that changes needed to be made, I would think, too. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, for me, when I look at my life, the most painful things I've gone through Mm -hmm. have actually helped me to get to another level of being. It's helped me to grow. And if I hadn't gone through those things, if I hadn't been uncomfortable, never would have happened. And so, you know, the word pathology, which we hear a lot in the medical field and also in the, you know, as, as therapists, you know, the root word of pathology is pathos, which means suffering. Mm. And then the word psychotherapy, psycho, the root words is psyche, which refers to the soul. Mm. And therapy is the Latin word therapuin, which is to attend to. So psychopathology or psychotherapy is to attend to the suffering of the soul. And symptoms like anxiety are expressions of the suffering of the soul. The soul needs attention. The Mm. soul needs to be attended to. And so when you attend to someone who's suffering, you know, you you think of someone who has a broken leg or they're sick with the flu, you know, you you care for them. Right. You know, there's a sense of, you know, you get help make them comfortable. You see what they need to eat. You make sure they're rested and nourished. But you don't get mad at them because they have the flu. Right. (laughs) And you don't tell them, you know, can you go over there and just stay there? I have other things and you're really you being here being sick is inconvenience for me. (laughs) Or or can't you just get over that? Like can't you just get (laughs) over the flu? (laughs) And or 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 ignore them. Yes. You know? And so we tend to do that with our mental health symptoms. Mm -hmm. We we judge them. We um wish they weren't there. We see them as nuisances and just want to get rid of them. And so with union therapy, it, it's not about getting rid of the symptom mm. because we have to know what what is that anxiety here to tell you? What's going on with that? And that is actually attending to the soul. And when you're able to dig into those layers of what is the meaning or the purpose of this anxiety – that's how you're able to address the symptoms because when the symptoms are attended to, then they will go away. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, even though, I mean, I don't necessarily identify myself as a depth psychologist, you know, my perspective with anxiety is, yeah, let's let's welcome this anxiety as like a harbinger. Like it's saying yeah. to you, I, I need something that I'm not getting. Like, yes. and, yeah. and to me, just changing that relationship, you mm-hmm. know, not seeing it as like something I want to avoid or push away or ignore yeah. that, like, let's, let's tune in. Let's see. Turning towards this part of you. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I think that change in relationship then can, again, uh, allow the the sort of defenses to maybe fall away. So you can hear what you need. Well, well when we turn towards these, these parts of ourselves, you know, like the anxiety, you're actually getting into relationship with, with yourself instead of rejecting yourself, pushing yourself away, mm-hmm. you know, cutting yourself off. You're actually you know, turning towards this part of you and becoming yeah. curious, uh, being compassionate, mm-hmm. staying connected to, and that in and of itself is healing. Yes, absolutely. Well, you mentioned a little bit ago that with Jungian psychology and depth psychology that that dreams can be a part of that, of the therapy. Um, this is something that has always sort of intrigued me. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Um so we dream every night, whether or not we remember them, okay? Yep. People will say, I don't remember my dreams. Well, it doesn't mean that you're not having them. <laughs> and <laughs> and um, one of the things that Jung found in his research of, of, um, of working with his clients in their dreams is that oftentimes um, our dreams will reveal to us parts of our unconscious. So it's a way, another way to see, okay, what's, what, what is it that I'm not aware of? What is it that I'm, I'm not paying attention to? Mm. And, you know, the other thing I want to, to also make sure I, I say is that there is no dream 
guide or dream dictionary. Mm. You know, there are there are symbols that, you know, perhaps, you know, when you think of the ocean, we think of feelings or emotions or oneness or, you know, those types of things. And so there are general, um, I guess, associations that we, we as a human collective have about certain symbols like the sun, you know, mm-hmm. or, or water. Mm-hmm. However, you know, when you're working with dreams with a union psychotherapist or analyst, it's really the, the client who is going to determine what the dream means. Oh, that's and interesting. The ther- yeah, the therapist is there to help you kind of get at that mm-hmm. and has tools and questions so that you are able to um, hear the message of the dream. But a union therapist is not going to sit there and say, okay, so this is what this is, or this, that's not, right. um, this that's means not the way. That, right, this yeah. means you want to go have sex with your mother. No, right. that's not. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing too is sometimes, um, you know, oh, this is a, I'm not sure where I saw this quote, but anyway, um, and I'm probably totally botching it, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> The quote goes um, something like that, that dreams don't tell us, first of all, dreams don't tell us something we already know. Mm -hmm. And dreams are not going to tell you, meaning the therapist or the client, what you want to hear. The dream is going to tell you the reality of the individual psyche exactly as it is. Mm -hmm. And that's what's powerful about dreams is that, you know, we, you know, um, can sit with another and and, you know, tell a story of what we're struggling with. And we may not even be aware that we're not being fully honest with ourselves about what's really happening. Mm-hmm. And or we may hold back um, as clients in therapy. We don't tell our therapist all of this other stuff. Right. And we may not even be aware of it, you mm-hmm. know. And the beauty of dreams, um, one of the beauty, beautiful aspects of dreams is that the dream, the dream maker, the dream teller doesn't do that. The dream is going to tell you. You know, this is, this is what's happening. This is what um, you need to look at. And so um, what I love about dreams is when clients are um, open to working with their dreams, it really enriches, deepens, and I feel accelerates the therapy. Mm -hmm. And I'll just give an example. And I'm, I'm making sure to change this so that you know, obviously, confidentiality is protected with with a client. So this is not a client's actual dream. Okay, okay. Okay, so this is a dream that I'm going to share that is um, parts of other um, dreams. But I was working with an individual who came in with a dream. And in in this dream, he was uh, in a vehicle. The vehicle color was black. And there were other parts of the dream. And um, we we talked about, you know, what what the scenery was, um, where the vehicle went, all of these other aspects of the dream. We talked a little bit about the color of the vehicle. What do you think that means? But it, it really, we really didn't get much further than that in the session. Mm-hmm. And again, my, the, you know, the, the way that you know you have gotten to the meaning of a dream is you have an aha. It's like really like this, oh my gosh, mm-hmm. that's what the dream Okay. And, and, and if you don't, and I, and I see that all the time too with clients. And so that's how you know, and it's, and it's the client's aha, not the therapist. Right. Um, and, you know, before the next session, uh, this individual contacted me and told me that they wanted to tell me this before they chickened out before the next session and basically told me that they knew what that black vehicle meant. Mm. And it was something that they had not shared in therapy yeah. And, um, you know, a vehicle is how we move through life. You yeah. know, you look at who's driving, you know, wow. um, are you driving or someone else driving? How are you driving? Are you paying attention? Are you driving carelessly? Yeah. Do you know where you're going? And who's in the vehicle with you? And, you know, this client, because of this, told me I knew immediately what the black car represented, even though we went through the whole session. But uh, he, he wasn't able to say it. Yeah, yeah. Just you know, needed to kind of sit with it themselves. So, um, you know, came in and we were actually able to finally get to the root of what this black car represented. It, it, there was a lot of shame around it. Um, mm. But, you know, when we were talking about it, I said, well, a vehicle is how you're moving through life. It describes, you know, the state of your, of your emotional body, you know, mm-hmm. and you know, the direction you're going in. And we talked about, you know, what are, what do you think black could mean? And, and you know, so you look at the sim- symbolism of black, okay, it could mean death, it can mean endings, it can mean darkness, shadow. Mm-hmm. So 
what is the darkness or shadow that you are driving in right now that mm. you know and and i and, and in retrospect i remembered that when we were talking about the color that there was a I, now i realized that that was what i was seeing that that was like a you know like a oh my gosh that's that's what this means to me yeah. yeah, and and so that's an, one example, and then I'll share another. This is a personal example. So, I was working with my union therapist, and I was telling her about this dream I had that I was uh, in a room, and there was some woman banging on the door on the other mm. side, <laughs> and she was really trying to get in, and I was like, I was not going to let this person into my my room, and I was just, yeah, you know, and the door was like shaking, and I was in the dream that was pretty much, you know, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I learned is that in dreams, um, if there's someone that you don't know in a dream, mm -hmm. you know, one of the ways you can work with that is, um, is there a part of yourself that you're not aware of, right. or you don't, you don't want to know? Yeah. And for me, it was, um, what part of you are you not wanting to let in? Mm. What are you fighting against? You know? Mm -hmm. And and what part of you is desperately trying to connect with you? Mm. And what would happen if, you know, you open the door to this part of you? Yeah. And it was just powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so powerful. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. funny, I'm thinking of a dream I had relatively recently, and it was, uh, it, it occurred around some of my family of origin drama, which I will not get into, but... Um, <laughs> And it was a nightmare. Like, I don't, I, I remember dreams often, and I don't typically get startled awake. But it was, you know, knowing there was someone in the house, there was this dark room that I was walking into, getting ready to sort of push my, turn, hold my hand against the wall inside the dark room to find the light switch, and feeling there was a person there, and being... Wow terrified and, you know, trying to call for help and unable to oh, reach out. Wow. Yeah. And so waking up like, <gasps> but then, mm -hmm. you know, sitting with that, I also, you know, kind of talked to my therapist about it. And she also said, well, you know, maybe whoever that was behind the door or behind, you know, inside that dark room is a part of you that you need to move toward. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it just made the dream s such a different, you know, just changed my perspective, you know, that it yeah. wasn't quite so scary. It's just a part of me. And, and the other thing too, because, you know, sometimes people will say, I had this dream where, you know, maybe something really violent happened or I did something that I would never do. You know, I held up a bank and shot at police officers or right. you know, something. Yeah. Like, what, like what, what's going on? Like, I can't even believe this. Or, um, or I was, you know, having sex with all these people. I don't even know what was going on. Right, right. And why would, why would I be why doing would, that in my dreams? Yeah. Right. And so it's important to know that, you know, the unconscious speaks to you in metaphor and symbol right. and the intensity of the images and the action just speaks to the intensity of the unconscious trying to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. And so I encourage people not to be terrified because maybe there's death in a dream or violence or, or you know, some kind of deep wounding or betrayal or an orphaning. Um, you know, I, you know, another dream I had, which, you know, I think if I had not done all this work and study around, <laughs> you just totally scared me. But I had a dream and actually... There were only words. I can't even remember the image, but the words were, you have less than a year. Mm. Oh, my gosh. You know, I woke up like, what the hell does that mean? Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. And um, I really sat with that, and I realized that it made me think about, Lourdes, what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your life? You know, what matters most? If you really had a year, mm. what would you do differently? Mm. And that really kind of like, you know, because what had happened is I was out of balance. Um, I was stretched in so many directions through the practice, the podcast, the business, you know. Yes, <laughs> yes, totally. And, you know, the sense you've never done working on the business and what about doing this and that. And to be honest, I was kind of tired of it and done. Mm. And I just needed to leave it alone and know it was enough. And um, I was neglecting very important parts of my life, my health, my family. Yeah. And 
this really pulled me back because remember the purpose of of dreams and the unconscious is to bring you back into balance of what you're not aware of. You know, I was aware of it that yeah, I'm really busy right now, but to have those words say you have less than a year, that grabbed my attention like no other. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right? Well, and and it could be less than a year for anything, like less than a year right. to fix this, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But for me, I thought, well, what if you really heard those words? And yes. What are the contexts that you could hear those words in? And I, mm. when I realized, what if you had to hear those words like you have less than a year to live or someone in your life has less than a year, what would be different? Mm. you know, Lourdes. And I thought, oh my gosh, that was that aha. This is what I need to do. Yeah. And that's, you know, that was um, really significant for me. And, mm. you know, again, the basic purpose of dreams is to communicate what is unconscious. And a dream is usually calling to our attention something that is out of our immediate awareness. It's a blind spot. Mm-hmm. And again, the second thing that I think is important, the images in dreams are not to be taken literally See them as parts of yourself or see them as metaphors of the processes in your life. So if in your dream you are walking through an airport and you don't can't find your gate and you're dragging all this luggage, you know, look at that. So where in my life is that process happening that I'm at a place where I need I need to leave and go somewhere, but I don't know where I'm going and I'm dragging all this luggage with me. Like Mm. what's luggage? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so, you know, I think that those are kind of the two things I would say, you know, for someone who is, you know, maybe interested in beginning to work with their dreams. Mm. I think in college, maybe I took a class where we were supposed to record our dreams and people were like, I don't ever remember or, you know, I don't want to wake up and, you know, write my dreams down. But they had instructed us to like before falling asleep to tell us, you know, they, tell yourself, I'm going to wake up and write down my dream. Yeah. And then go back to sleep. And I can remember like waking up, like once I got in the habit of it, that, you know, I think it was just a week or something, but like waking up the next day and not even remembering that I'd woken up in the night and yeah. written it down, which is kind of crazy. So are you asking? Like, uh, I, yes. What am I asking? Like, so how do you, is there a process to help people be, get more in touch and remember their dreams? Yes, there, there is, there are things you can do. And mm-hmm. what I can also do is I actually have a, a PDF for this. So I will oh, cool. give you that information later. And yep, if people I'll... want it, it's just this basic working with dreams thing. Cool. So um, working with dreams is like beginning to use a muscle that has not been exercised in a mm-hmm. while. Mm-hmm. So at the beginning, it's going to feel awkward. Um, you'll feel like it's not working. And what's the point? Mm-hmm. But if you stick with it over time, your dream recall will improve okay. and get stronger. So one of the very basic things you can do, and you, you you mentioned this, is just set the intention before you fall asleep that um, you want to pay attention to your dreams and you want to remember them. Mm-hmm. The other thing is try to do this um, on a day when you don't have to wake up to an alarm clock. So if there are any times you can wake up naturally, those are really great days to, to really try to set that intention of, I'm going to remember my dreams. Alarms are kind of, they... They disrupt our natural uh, flow. And so it's because of that jarring wake, waking, it's very difficult to remember our dreams. Oh, that makes so so much sense. (laughs) Yeah. Um, The other thing, too, is when you when you first wake up naturally, if if it's not to uh, an alarm is stay still for a while and just lay there and really try to be with that dream with the ending of it. Mm -hmm. If you can. You know, uh, don't move right away. Stay in the dream as long as you can. And often this will help you recall more of the dream than if you started moving right away. Record, you know, write your dream down right away. But I also recommend, like, if if you think I can't write that fast to write this all down, (laughs) um, uh, I tell, you know, then then record it into your phone if you have, like, some kind of Mm, recording app. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just speak it into your phone and then later on you can write it down. Yeah. And it's okay if you only remember snippets or parts of the dream. Record what you remember. Sometimes people say, all I remember is I was walking in the desert. Mm -hmm. Is that significant? Should I even work with that? And there's no such thing as an insignificant dream. Hmm. And you don't have to have these huge, big 
dreams with, you know, there was this dragon and this huge waterfall <laughs> and stars were shooting across the sky. <laughs> it would be the most mundane dream. Yeah. And there are different types of dreams, you know, and, and some dreams are what we call big dreams. And, you know, there that's also a different type of dream. But then there are the other ones where, you know, you walked out your door and you and you opened your door and there was a dog standing there, you know, in yes. front of your door. Right. Yeah. Right. Sort of everyday um, experiences, maybe. And then I think another thing, like, let's say you don't have much time, you're just jotting it down. Try to give the dream a title. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Just to sort of summarize in your own head what yeah. it was about. Yeah. And, and the other thing, too, that's important about because people say, do I have to keep a journal? Can I just like put in my phone, you know, like a memo? Mm -hmm. um, the reason I encourage actually having a dream journal, even if you print out your dreams and put them in like a, a three ring binder mm -hmm. is dreams. Um, what I love about them, too, is that it might be two months, a year after when you go back and read your dreams. It's like a total aha. Yeah. A times you don't see the meaning until you look at them backwards there were some dreams where i was just like i have no idea what this means and that's okay you know that's okay to not know at all i promise when you go back and read your dream journal you'll say oh my gosh that's that's what this was about mm. and then dreams start to have this connection it's incredible to do that and wow. so if you want to, have to be able to do that you need to have them all in one place and sort of yeah whether it's a theme or an aha moment but being able to see them from this farther yeah. away perspective. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, I think that, um, what, what I, what I love about dreams also is that if you are able to begin paying attention to your dreams and working with them, it's like you have this, um, uh, direct line to your intuition, to, to, to this compass. And you begin to even, you know, when you're struggling with something, you don't know what to do. You just know, okay, I'm just going to literally sleep on it. <laughs> see what, you know, what does the dream want to tell me? And, you know, you know, some clients say this is God. Some clients say it's my intuition or my soul or my inner compass. It's the wise part of me. I don't know, you know, call it whatever you want. This is a very, um, wise, loving part of you that is trying to give you messages uh, to help you, you know, live a more fulfilling, meaningful, complete, balanced life. Mm. I love that perspective. And um, to me, it just creates this connection between your awake life and your sleep life. Yeah, it's it's a connection between conscious and unconscious. And yeah, yeah. You know, Jung said, um, you know, dreams are the guiding words of the soul. Mm. And, um, you know, again, I, when, when your dreams speak to you and you're able to, to hear the message, you know that you are hearing a very deep truth for you. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, interesting, just talking to you and telling you that part of my dream, I've like, my brain is going, oh, <laughs> yeah, I get it now. That's funny. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so if there were resources or tips that you felt like it was important for the listeners to know about, what would they be? Well, I think, um, again, you know, first of all, to to not be scared by intense images or uh, processes in your dream. Mm. You know, because a lot of times people get scared of them or they feel like they don't make any sense. You know, I was in this house, then I was here, and then this was upside down. Like, what the, you know, what does that mean? <laughs> and so, again, look at it as a metaphor. You know, if there, if, if there are parts of the dream that seem like they shouldn't connect, like this doesn't make sense, what do those two parts symbolize what can they be metaphors for and where in your life are you maybe experiencing that as something you're you're trying to connect that really doesn't connect mm -hmm. if that makes sense and also play with your dreams you know dreams it's not about sitting down going i'm going to figure this out i'm going to do all the associations you know a lot of times it's just thinking about the dream thinking of the images and then letting it go it may be and you know to to not uh take them like a to not approach it like a written exercise. It's, you know, you're, it's, it's a very playful, open, um, 
energy and just seeing what the dream reveals. Some dreams don't want to tell you yet what they mean, and Mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and there's no right or wrong way to to work with your dreams. I mean, I I give clients, you know, some handouts on how to do this, but everyone finds their own way, and that's okay. Yeah, there's there's no right or wrong way to do your dream work. Um, I just again. I, I don't recommend getting a dream dictionary, okay? <laughs> the only thing. Because again, you, that means you're taking someone else's meaning. Yeah. What these symbols are. Yeah, yeah. And it's sort of locking you into this other perspective versus your yeah. own. Yeah. yeah. If people wanted to know more about depth psychology or Jungian psychology, are there people or resources or websites that would be helpful? Um, I think that one of the best places to start would be um, if you are fortunate enough to live in a city where there's a Jung Center Mm -hmm. to check out whatever offerings they have for the public. They generally have public offerings and then also offerings, you know, for people who are for um, mental health professionals who are looking to get training or their CEs. Mm -hmm. Also, several of them offer online or distance courses, and for I'm, you know the Jung Center in Houston, Texas, is has an has an amazing community program as well as programs for professionals, and they have a lot of it available online. Oh, and cool. I think that you know, if you're interested in Jungian psychology, then I, I would start with with a with um, one of the Jung centers across the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, I th- also on my website, on under resources, I list um, some some other books and resources for deaf psychology. If you um, like audiobooks and you kind of just want to hear about the basic themes of deaf psychology from someone who can explain it in English, and I say that because one of the I think drawbacks of people um, learning more about Jung and his work is that you know he you know he was Swiss and his mm. work was translated and. It is written in a different it's, – it's kind of a laborious, heavy mm. process to read his work. Okay. And so um, Dr. James Hollis, who's my mentor and he was on my dissertation committee, mm-hmm. has authored and written several books. One of them is Through the Dark Wood, Finding Meaning in the Second Half of Life. It's only available as an audio book. But if you listen to that – and I, I would say it's like 12 hours of, of him wow. speaking. You'll get the basic tenets of – Union psychology. And he does it in a way that the average person, you don't even have to be a, a mental health professional, can get it. And and that's what I love about him is that he brings the concepts and the abstractions into reality. Hmm. So I recommend anything by James Hollis. Nice. Um, yeah. And I think that I, I guess I could keep going, but that's well, a good and, start. <laughs> and, I, and I can link to, you know, in the show notes, I will link to your resource page so people can find the stuff there. Uh, So, so I want to talk about your podcast and just say, um, I was a guest on Lourdes's podcast, Women in Depth, probably almost I meant to look it up, but it feels like it was almost a year ago. Maybe I think it was almost a year. Yeah. And it was one of my first podcast interviews. But also, because we focused on women and anxiety, it really sort of Uh, sparked the flame for me for this podcast, although it it took a while for that flame to fully ignite. Um, I think that's really what what (laughs) yeah, it just got me thinking like, hmm, this could be a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, I'm so so glad, um, Biz, that we had that conversation too, because um, you know, it's exciting to see that here you are with your own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I and I love your podcast so much. So talk to us a little bit about that and how people can find you. So the Women in Depth podcast, um, the whole title is Women in Depth Conversations about the Inner Lives of Women. Mm-hmm. And in the podcast, we explore aspects of a woman's experience that are beneath the surface, unconscious. So this is what's uncomfortable, uncertain, unknown, unfamiliar, even taboo. Mm. And we look at all this stuff in terms of, you know, the, the experience of being a woman. So relationships, motherhood, and then things also, you know, like aging, healing, suffering, loss, which of course, it's not just women, but we look at these areas specifically in terms of a woman's experience and the the part of her experience that perhaps is not right up on the surface where you can see. Mm. 
Okay. And um, you can find me uh, and the podcast um, at my website, which is www.lordesviado.com. All right. Well, Lourdes, thank you so, so much for being on the podcast with me. And I just really appreciate this conversation. And I feel like I took away some uh, extra new knowledge. So that's also super fun. Well, thank you, Biz. This was an honor. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And, um, you know, thanks for inviting me and having me on the podcast. Thanks again for joining us on the Women Warriors podcast this week. I really enjoyed talking to Lourdes. One, she is just so easy to talk to, but two, she is a wealth of knowledge for Jungian psychology and dream work. And I came away with some, as I said in the podcast, I came away with some new learning about dreams and how to um, make sense of them or use them to better understand myself. The whole idea of our unconscious bringing to light things that maybe we aren't paying attention to or need some more attention in our lives uh, really rings very true for me personally when managing anxiety and dealing with my own anxiety and how I help clients with their anxiety, that if we can see it as, see the anxiety as a harbinger, a messenger, a part of us that needs attention and maybe isn't being heard or seen and welcoming that part into our life with curiosity and compassion to help us better understand how to take care of ourselves. So Once again, thank you listeners and subscribers to the podcast. Um, I appreciate your support and continued tuning in. I hope you all have a wonderful week. Ciao for now from This Woman Warrior. Thanks for listening and subscribing to the Woman Warriors podcast. Music was written and performed by Andy Cush. If you'd like more information on this episode, you can find the show notes, the resources shared today, and links to the guests' profiles at womanwarriors.com.